Hey everyone, it's Nurse Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over fluid volume deficit. So let's get started. Fluid volume deficit occurs in the body because there's not enough fluid in it to support its needs and functions. Now you may also hear fluid volume deficit referred to as hypovolemia or dehydration. And dehydration can occur for many different reasons, with one reason being that there's a loss of water or electrolytes in the body. And we're specifically talking about the electrolyte sodium. Another reason it can happen is because the patient just isn't consuming enough water or electrolytes, or the patient has had something happen in their body where water has shifted around within those fluid compartments. For instance, water has moved from the intravascular compartment to the interstitial compartment, which is referred to as third spacing. So fluid volume deficit results in a deficit of fluid within our fluid compartments. And some fluid compartments can be more affected than others. And this really depends on the type of dehydration that we're talking about. So let's quickly review those fluid compartments. So we have two fluid compartments. We have intracellular and extracellular. Intracellular is the inside of the cell. Extracellular is the outside of the cell. And it can be subdivided into three other compartments. We have the interstitial compartment, which is the fluid that surrounds the cell found in between the cell. Then we have the intravascular compartment and this is the fluid inside of our vessels we also refer to this as the plasma and then we have the transcellular compartment and this is the smallest compartment of them all and this is the fluid that is found within certain organs and joints like your heart and your lungs and etc and fluid within these compartments can actually be shifted around through a process known as osmosis. And this process is highly affected by the osmolarity of specifically that extracellular fluid. So let's quickly review the different types of movements we can have based on osmolarity. So if we have a hypertonic environment in that extracellular fluid, so we have a high amount of solute concentration, what that's going to do is it's going to pull fluid from the inside of that cell to the outside of the cell, where the cell is going to shrink and become really dehydrated. Then we can have a hypotonic environment where the extracellular fluid is really diluted. So it has a low osmolarity, a low amount of solutes in it. And what's going to happen is that water is going to move from that extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment inside that cell and cause that cell to get really big and swell and eventually it could rupture. Then we can have an isotonic environment. And this is where there's an equal amount of solutes on the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. So we have equal osmolarity osmolarity. So there's no drastic shifting of water from intracellular to extracellular or extracellular to intercellular. It really just stays the same. So with all those concepts in your mind, let's now take a closer look at the causes of fluid volume deficit and the different types of dehydration. So the first type of dehydration is known as hypertonic. And this is where there's mainly a loss of water rather than electrolytes, hence our solutes, which we're mainly talking about sodium. This is also sometimes referred to as hypernatremia, which means we have a high amount of sodium in the blood. So when we're talking about hypertonic, tonic dehydration, we're talking about things causing the extracellular compartment, hence really our intravascular system, to become extremely concentrated with solutes, specifically sodium, and we're going to have less fluid in there. And that's what really hypertonic means. It means that our extracellular fluid has a high osmolarity and again is really highly concentrated of these solutes. So the result of this in these conditions is that water is going to move from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular compartment, and our cell is going to shrink and become dehydrated. So when we're thinking of causes of this type of dehydration, let's think of causes that makes our blood more concentrated, which would be like losing a lot of water. And this is happening in cases of severe diarrhea or vomiting or with diabetes insipidus. And this is where the patient is passing a high volume of urine due to a low ADH level, which is antidiuretic hormone. And when the patient has this, it's literally just ridding their body of all of this fluid through the urine. So we're not going to have a lot left in our blood. Hence, we'll have a lot more solutes or sodium. And then another cause is that the patient is just not taking in enough water. And this can happen for many reasons. Maybe they don't have access to water or they're experiencing impaired thirst where they're not able to really recognize that they need to take in water. So they easily become dehydrated. And treatment for this type of dehydration is usually to rehydrate that cell. And we can do that by administering hypotonic fluids 
because hypotonic fluids change the tonicity or the osmolarity of our extracellular fluid by adding more free water to it, which is hence going to, in a sense, water down that high solute concentration. And it's going to allow osmosis to pull water into that dehydrated cell and rehydrate it. Then we have hypotonic dehydration. And this occurs when there's mainly a loss of electrolytes, hence our sodium, rather than water. So it's the opposite of hypertonic dehydration. And this is sometimes referred to as hyponatremia, so a low sodium level in the blood. And hypotonic means that, that extracellular fluid has a low osmolarity. So there's this low concentration of solutes, particularly, again, sodium in that fluid. And because of these conditions in this fluid, it's going to result in water moving from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment. And the cell is going to swell and possibly rupture. And the problem with this type of dehydration is that it can quickly deplete the intravascular compartment, our plasma, which can result in a low cardiac output. And when you're trying to think of the causes of this type of dehydration, think of causes that lead the body to lose electrolytes or conditions that dilute solutes. And some things that can do this is administering too much of certain diuretics, specifically like thiazides, because thiazides waste too much sodium, or too much free water replacement, because this lowers the amount of solutes, like, you know, with hypotonic solutions. So we have a loss of solute concentration. And starvation or malnourishment can do this, because the person is not consuming enough electrolytes. And treatment for this type of dehydration could include administering hypertonic solutions because these solutions will go in there and help remove the fluid from those swollen cells because what it will do is it'll change the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid, which is going to, through osmosis, draw water out of that swollen cell and put it back into the extracellular compartment. And then lastly, we have isotonic dehydration. And this is where we've had an equal loss of water and electrolytes. And remember, iso means equal. And with this, there's no drastic shifting of water between those fluid compartments. And this is actually the most common type of dehydration we see. And the big problems that arise from this type of dehydration is that intravascular loss can happen. And we're going to lose the ability to pump fluid throughout the body. And this could quickly lead to hypovolemic shock. Causes for this type of dehydration include overusage of diuretics, third spacing of fluids where water shifts from the intravascular space to the interstitial space. The patient has experienced some type of trauma, like they're bleeding out, losing all that fresh, nice blood in the body, or they're experiencing vomiting, diarrhea, or excessive sweating. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms you're going to see in a patient who has fluid volume deficit. So we know the patient is going to be dehydrated. So D is for dry mucous membranes. When you look at their mucous membranes, they're going to be sticky and very dry and uncomfortable to the patient if they can communicate that to you. E is for early sign. With this, an early sign of dehydration is that they have an increased heart rate. And when you go to feel that pulse, it can feel very weak. H is for hypotension, so a low blood pressure. And the reason they're having this is because they don't have a lot of fluid blood volume to pump throughout that system. So when we go to measure that blood, pressure, it's going to be low. And this can present as orthostatic hypotension. And this is a form of hypotension that occurs when the patient goes from a supine or sitting position to a standing position. And this can happen up to three to five minutes after that person changes the position. So to have this, the patient's systolic blood pressure, that top number, is going to decrease at least 20 millimeters of mercury, or their diastolic blood pressure number, that bottom number, is going to decrease at least 10 millimeters of mercury. And these decreases are from their baseline blood pressure. So as a nurse, you wanna make sure that you get a baseline and you measure these blood pressures at these different positions. Why is for young babies, whenever they're dehydrated, how you can tell, especially in severe cases, is that they're gonna have sunken fontanelles. And these are like those soft spots on the young infant's head that they have because it helps facilitate vaginal birth delivery because those skulls plates haven't 
fully fused together. So normally they should not be sunken in. And if they are sunken in, this is an extremely bad sign. Then D is for decreased skin turgor. And what skin turgor is, is it's talking about skin elasticity. So whenever we go to check their skin turgor, instead of just bouncing back real quickly, it can tint, it can be very sluggish, it'll be decreased, that's how we would refer to it. Now, there's a certain patient population you can't really use this as a great indicator of dehydration, and that's the older adults, the geriatric population. Because as we get older, so does our skin elasticity. It's naturally going to decrease in itself. So we want to check other signs and symptoms in those patients. And then we have R, for refill to the capillaries is going to be sluggish. So in severe cases of dehydration, when we go to check that capillary refill, it's going to be sluggish. It can be greater than three seconds. Also, attitude changes can occur where the patient becomes extremely restless, lethargic, confused, and it could progress to seizures. So if you start to see mental status changes in a patient with dehydration, this indicates you're dealing with a very severe case of dehydration because now it's affecting our neuro status, which we really don't want it to get to that point. And then another sign is thirst. So the patient could just be extremely thirsty that's trying to replace those fluids that they have lost or those electrolytes. Now, not all patients are going to have this. For example, geriatric patients. As we get older, so does our thirst response. So we're not as responsive to that sensation of thirst. Also, young patients may not even be able to communicate thirst to you. So you definitely don't wanna use that as a specific sign for those patients. Experience weight loss is another sign and symptom and actually Actually, measuring a patient's weight is a good way to tell us about their fluid status. So we definitely want to make sure we're weighing our patients. So you want to remember that one kilogram, about 2.2 pounds, is equal to about one liter of fluid, give or take. So as you're weighing your patient, look at the trending of those weights. If they're experiencing dehydration, are they losing weight? Have they lost weight? one kilogram, that could mean that they've lost one liter of fluid. And then we have lastly D for diagnostics. So let's go over the diagnostic results that you would be seeing in a patient with dehydration. And the lab results you're gonna see really depend on the type of dehydration that the patient has. So you wanna keep that in mind whenever we're going over these lab results. But in a nutshell with fluid volume deficit, what's happening is that we have a low amount of fluid. So when we remove that fluid out of the body, what we have left are those solutes. So the concentration of them are going to be really high in our blood and in our urine. So it's going to be increased all around, which is the opposite of what we've seen in fluid volume overload. Everything was diluted. So everything was decreased because we had so much water watering down those solutes. Therefore, you're going to see an increased serum osmolality, which is measuring the osmolality in the blood. You're going to see an increased hemoglobin, hematocrit, increased BUN, increased sodium level. And again, if we were dealing with hypotonic dehydration, that wouldn't be the case because remember, we're actually going to be lowering our sodium level in that type. So just keep that in mind. And an increased specific urine gravity and osmolality. But again, this is not going to be the case with, let's say, patients who have diabetes insipidus because that urine is going to be extremely diluted because they are passing high volumes of it from that low level of ADH. Now let's talk about nursing interventions for fluid volume deficit. So the goal is that we want to replace that water and electrolytes that have been lost. And treatment's gonna revolve around finding the cause and treating the cause. So let's say the patient is bleeding out somewhere. Well, we want to find why they're bleeding, stop that bleeding, and transfuse them some blood. Or let's say the patient has just been taking too many diuretics, they have urinated all their fluid out. What we wanna do is stop those diuretics and infuse some more fluid with electrolytes added to it to help correct that imbalance. So as a nurse, what we can do to help with this whole treatment of correcting fluid volume deficit is that we can provide daily weights. So we wanna weigh the patient at the same time every day with the same scale. And we're looking at those weights. Are they trending up? Are they trending down? Now, a fluid volume deficit, we wanna make sure that our patient isn't losing weight because that's one of those signs and symptoms. So we're going to be looking at that weight, making sure it's going up. We also wanna make sure that we are strictly measuring their intake and output. So everything that they're taking in, this includes IV fluids, IV flushes, anything that they take in orally, or their tube feedings, irrigations, and so forth. 
and we want to make sure we know exactly what they are putting out. Of course, this is urine, but it also includes vomit, any types of watery diarrhea or suction. We want all that in our calculation. And we particularly want to pay attention to that urinary output because this tells us how well our kidneys are working and if we are improving their hydration status. So we want to calculate that out over that 24 hour period. So you want to make sure that your patient's putting out at least 30 mLs per hour or 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour, which is based on their weight. In addition, we wanna make sure that we are encouraging treatments that help hydrate the body. So for instance, oral hydration, that's one of the easiest ways to help rehydrate your patient. Now, not all patients can do this, and in some cases, they're so severely dehydrated that they're gonna need that extra help with those IV fluids. But we wanna make sure that our patient has access to these fluids and that they're consuming healthy fluids promote healthy hydration, avoiding like teas and coffees. And we're gonna play a role with administering IV fluids per the doctor's orders. So typically isotonic fluids are used, but in different types of dehydration, for example, hypotonic dehydration, we may want to administer hypertonic fluids. And then in hypertonic dehydration, hypotonic fluids may be used. So it really depends on the type of dehydration your patient has on what fluids we're gonna use. And then also we want to make sure that we're looking at those electrolyte reports and checking the sodiums, the potassiums, and all those levels to make sure that they're within normal range. Okay, so that wraps up this review over fluid volume deficit. Now, I also have a review on fluid volume overload. If you want to check that out as well, you can access that in the YouTube description below. And thank you so much for watching.